All right. Yes, let's let's turn our hearts and minds toward Christ, if that's humanly possible, um, at this point, and uh, look into the Word of God. I am not going to require anything of Brother Ken because uh, he wasn't here for this lesson last week. But does anybody else remember what we studied last week, Brother Larry? Uh, David prayed essentially to be protected uh, from the evil and kind of compared the devil to a lion, mm -hmm. or the people that were oppressing him. Anybody else? Very disappointing. We did talk about about him being referred to as the apple of his eye. Anything else? Now, I threatened this the last time that I asked for review of the previous chapter, and I will threaten one more time. If we don't have more class participation from everyone, we'll start doing quizzes again. <laughs> and then you can show everybody how much you actually remember by grade. <laughs> Chapter 18. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> uh, Chapter 18 is a little bit of a culmination, if you will, of what we've been talking about to this point because we have stated in the previous 17 psalms to one degree or another that these psalms take place during David's flight from Saul. The superscription of chapter 18 reads, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. This, by the very words of the superscription of the of the uh, of the uh, the detailed the, the note, if you will, left by the psalmist, lets us know that this chapter is a capstone of all the all the please Lord protects protect me's and, and not to belittle them but that that is a lot of what we see in the previous Psalms it talks about attackers it talks about being in distress it talks about being uh, uh, feeling far away from God and this chapter finally comes we see the Lord come through now by that by the fact that we have 17 previous psalms, although not all of them are exactly in chronological order, but the, the vast majority of the previous psalms fall into that time period. That means that David spent a lot of time unsure of where his life was going to end. David spent a lot of time wondering just exactly what would happen, and we'll keep that in mind as we enter... Uh, the chapter says, and from the hand of Saul, and he said. So the the the, the superscription, or the or the or the note, or the or the title area, or the the subtitle, if you will, of this leads into the verses. And he said, "I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler." and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The first three verses of this chapter offer a triumphant praise. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Now David did not arrive, again, did not arrive at this just, he prayed and something happened. You can look at the book of First Samuel and tell David spent a long time on the run. And not just David. You know, you think about what well, David was by himself and David was alone, but David was also caring, caring for a band of men. 
He had uh, his, who would eventually be the general of his army, Joab and his brethren were there with him, and, 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 and a, a host of around 50 were, were there with him. And he was caring and, and worrying about them. At, at one point, he was alone. He was running. He had to go into the temple and eat the shoe bread just to survive. He, he got the shoe bread, and he, and he, and he got the sword of, of Goliath and, 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 and went out on his own. He spent a lot of time on the run. He even ran to the Philistines. He, he, he ran and, 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 and joined, I don't know necessarily joined himself to them, but, uh, but, but dwelt with them for some time. David had a hard road to hoe before he arrives at this. Now, it's always a, a, we always feel elated when the Lord does something for us. It, it's natural human emotion, at the very least, to enjoy when something goes right for us. When something happens exactly the way that we intend it to happen. But this takes time. How long did David pray for deliverance? A while. And you know what? He'd pray for deliverance and, 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 and perhaps even compose a song about this need for deliverance. And the next day, Saul would be on his tail again. We expect instant gratification to our prayers when patience is the tool through which He does His work. You know, the, the Lord sometimes... It, 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 I think you can see it in the stories of Job. I think you can see it in, in uh, um, the uh, Elijah's days. Um, how long can you hold out trusting in the Lord without the Lord doing anything for you? That's where the heat comes. We, we, we talk about oh, I, I, you know, being tried by the Lord and it's, oh, look at all these trials and temptations, but the Lord's seeing us through. I, I, I think... A, 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 greater, a greater test of your mettle, if you will, is when you're faithful, you do all the right things, and you continually have doors slammed in your face. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. And what the Lord's looking for is your breaking point. At what point are you the weakest? And that's not a revelation to Him. It is a revelation for you. Will you give up under trial? David didn't. David continually cried for the Lord. And, and that's, I think, why the jubilation that you hear in these, in these first couple of verses is so... It's almost like an exhalation. Days and days of, of wondering, is this my last day, will lead to this type... When, when you're finally delivered will lead you to this type of and you can almost and I'm I'm not saying this is David's salvation experience but you could almost compare it to a salvation experience days and days and days of turmoil within for the ultimate release that come that that follows it's a um it's an experience that we all will will face from time to time brother Ken last Wednesday had some had 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 a, had a some very very hard times and my heart went out to him I didn't I didn't really know there's there's not a lot you can say in that situation because it's something that has to be endured you learn Amen. from those situations and I was upset for him because I have been there I have been I have been on the precipice of doing something exactly right and just have a door slammed in my face. And it is in that moment that, mo that, that, you know, when you have the door slammed in your face and everything's all quiet and you're all alone, what is your reaction? Do you pound against the door? Do you kick against the door? Do you cry up to the heavens, why is this happening? Do you turn away and never try again? Your reaction in that moment defines your Christian character, who you are when you're all alone. Even, and, and when all this happened, the entire church was present. But he was all alone in that moment. David had 50 men around him, and he was all alone. What does he continue to do? Well, David just keeps writing music, keeps trusting, keeps starting from a place of weakness, like a lot of those psalms do, and rising to a place of strength. The Lord's going to take care of this. The Lord's going to take care of this. And 
does the Lord always do things in your time frame? Absolutely not. Why would he? Because his thoughts are higher than, paraphrasing of course, his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. We don't know what would have happened if we'd just gotten our way. All we do know, though, is that if we are faithful to the path, if we, if we stay the course, if you will, God's will will be worked out. Nothing's catching him by surprise. And we talk about a straight and narrow way. Or we talk about one door. And a lot of time, a lot of that stuff is uh, how you live your Christian life or, or, or salvation. There's only one way in, right? But I, I even think you can take that principle further. There are a dozen different ways you can do things in this life. There's all kinds of different paths. There are broad paths. There are steep paths. There, there, are, there are paths that look oh so sweet and easy. But there's only one that is the will of God. One way. One door. And we may have the door slammed in our face over and over, but we can trust that because we were attempting to do the work of the... If we're attempting to do the work of God. Now, that just isn't the door. We just haven't found it yet. We're slow, we're fallible, and we make mistakes. But as long as we're faithful to the work that the Lord's called us to do, we will find His way. We will. That requires effort on our part, and it requires us having our heads up, our eyes open, and being prepared for that moment. When a door of opportunity opens... I think we get enough doors slammed in our face about half the time we just say, I'm not even going to attempt it. Because why would I have the door slammed in my face again? Why would I do that to myself? And we lull ourselves into apathy. What was wrong at the church of Laodicea? Not a lot from what I could tell. Not all that different from your average Baptist church, to be perfectly honest. They thought they were rich, they thought they were doing all right, but they were lukewarm. God himself said, I just, I wish you were something. If you were cold, we can apply fire to it and get you hot. And if you were hot, that is a, that is a, liqu a form of liquid that I can use to my work. But since you're neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Unfit for my service. And we find ourselves that way. Why? Because we just don't seek opportunity. We're, t we're, 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 ti we're, we're tired. We're either wore down from the world or wore down from our, from our, from our own labor for the Lord. And we're like, I'm not going to do that. Why would I get the door slammed in my face again? Well, because that door could be it. That could be the way. We could, like David, be lifting him up, calling him my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. These are all places of defense. These are all places of, uh, uh, of safety. David is, in tr is, is placing the titles for the Lord God in, pl in, in things that are, um, are, are a safety for us, that are, that are a salvation for us, that are, are, are a defense for us. The, the sorrows of death can pass me and the floods uh, of the ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell can pass me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I, call, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Now, he talks a lot, a lot about what his situation was in the past tense. When we're offered time to speak of what the Lord's done for us, it's okay to talk about where you came from. Because that is a portent of the story, that the, 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 the ultimate glorification of the Lord. This is where I was, and this is where I am now. If, if, if you were to go on a phenomenal weight loss journey, what does everybody always do? They take a before picture, and they take an after picture. And although the glory for that is in yourself and how, how willful you were to lose weight, that before picture is part of the story. Everything that we were before we were saved, good, bad, and ugly, all of that is part of our story. Now, should we embrace that story? Should we love it? I can tell you as someone who has, in the past, not recently, but in the past lost a lot of weight, that before picture is not something you like to look at, 
but it tells you, I don't want to go back there again. And David said, I looked at where I was at. I had all this going on. Everything was going bad. And then I called upon the Lord and he heard. Does it say though, and he heard and went and came to my rescue. And he heard and was immediately there to fix all of my problems and make everything just a bed of roses. No, it just said that he heard. He was aware of David's suffering. He was aware of what was going on in his life. And he was going to take care of it. Where is children, folks? If my kids need something, I, can, I may not get it right that, that second. I may not even get it in the next couple of days. But I will do my best to help them if it's something they need, if it's something that, that, will, that, that, they, that will help them, that, that, that is, that is uh, needful for their survival. Now, there are some things that I will immediately go and help them with. Well, there's some other things that we're not going to do that right now. Why? Because I said so. Why? Because I said so. And I think we spend a lot of time with God. Why? And God says, because I said so. And we don't just leave it there. He, he, we have to have a reason. And God said, you don't need a reason from me. I'm God. <laughs> I don't have to explain myself to you. And we look up, but why? A lot of time wasted asking, but why? You know, David spent a lot of time on the run, but David was doing things while he was on the run. He wasn't just running for the sake of running, or just every time he found a place to sit down, going, oh, please help me, God. No, that's not, David didn't spend his time like that. David had some low moments. I think you can see him right here. He, he actually says, the sorrows of hell can pass me about. That's not good. That's not, a, that's not a fantastic place for a Christian to be. But ultimately, he pulled him, himself up by his own bootstraps, trusted that the Lord was going to take care of it, and just kept going until the Lord did do something for him. Then the earth shook and, the, and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth uh, devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. The dark, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of sky. And the brightness that was before him, and the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He went out. He sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen. The foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Now, verses... And the reason I read all that together, verses 7 to 16 is the deliverance of the Lord. It started out as a shake. It started out as a tremble. Uh, this is, if you've ever seen even, even a, a preview of the movie Jurassic Park, how do you know the T-Rex is coming? There's usually a cup of water and there's a, there's a shudder and the water shakes. First it just started out as the hills trembling. Then the skies came, but they said he blew out fire from his not he was he, it, it was it was something to behold and all of the earth all of nature trembled before the force of god and then he came literally flying in on a cherub shooting lightning it says that hailstones and coals of fire is repeated twice out of heaven rained uh, probably something very similar to what Sodom and Gomorrah experienced this is the power of our God. This is an example, a very small example, of what He can do. We spiritualize the power of God way too much. Right. Way too much. I believe 100%, especially all the miraculous miracles against disease and nature and demons, that Jesus did every bit of it just like He said He did it. When He said, peace be still, that water went glass-like. 
There wasn't a ripple to be seen. Well, maybe except for around Peter where he was floundering around in the water. But uh, you, 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 can, you can see the power of our God. Jesus was robed in flesh and still was able to just things happen around him. And this is not a tent. Literally, and I think all these, these trembling and everything is literally the earth shaking at the very presence of our God. He, he spoke, His words formed this place. His presence will shatter it like glass. And we're so fearful. We're so scared and we concern ourselves with so small a thing. When we, we stand as agents of this kind of power. Now, am I going to be able to say, you know, or grab a cripple by the hand and yank him up and say, be thou healed? No, I'm not an apostle. But there is a level of faith that we do possess and a fountain of power that we can access. And I'm talking about some mythical, well, if you just, if you just, you know, mumbo jumbo, if you just focus and you concentrate hard enough, you're just going to make stuff happen. Uh, no, but David prayed and prayed and trusted and prayed and trusted and prayed and trusted and prayed, and all of a sudden, the earth started shaking. The clouds went dark, and on the horizon, there was a light seen. Then death started raining upon his enemies all around. Who, who did all the God, of course. But here's something that you probably didn't think. Who preempted that? That was David. God, God requires us to ask things of him. That's why prayer is so important. Yeah. We need communication with God. Right. Does he have to jump every time we say frog? No. But he will come to your aid yeah. in a miraculous way. I've seen, I've seen things and I've probably missed things in my life that were the power of God working literally in my peripheral vision. I know I have. I, I've seen some of them with my own, own two eyes. You look at a situation and think, there's no way that it happened that way, but by dog it did. Right. It happened just that way. And, and we'll chalk it up to, well, you know, the, chalk it up to this, that, or the other thing. <laughs> Who is in control of all of it? Right. Who is in possession of all that power? Why did, the de- why did Christ not kneel to the devil? Well, for a host of reasons. But the biggest of all is this, is that in three and a half very short years, he was going to be in control of everything that the devil was offering. And he didn't need the devil's help. He didn't need nobody's help. He went up to Calvary. He come back and he was, in, he was not only the master of everything that Satan w- could have offered him, but so much more. And we sit as not only benefactors, not only as as uh, as, uh, as 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 brothers to to this this kind of power, to this kind of lineage, to this to this person, but also inheritors of it. You know what it means to inherit? That means that that is your legacy, and by right of second birth, it is yours. Don't worry about money. Don't worry about what uh, uh, Cindy Lou Who said to you. Don't worry about what. Uh, don't worry about what. Uh, you, uh, what uh, Biden's doing in his Oval Office. Don't. Don't worry about what uh, 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 the, the Russians are doing. Don't worry about what the Koreans, the Chinese, the Kung Flu. I don't care about any of it because ultimately it comes down to my relationship with God and my study of this book and who I can part, impart that to. Those are the only things that matter. And if you've got your, your sights focused or set on anything else, I'm sorry, they're not set on things above, they're set on things beneath. And that's just a simple fact of it. We are in this world, not of this world. And as possessors of a, of a more permanent location... 
all the things around us can become dim. Brother Larry, in his message, talked about the woman that uh, told Wayne Adams that she was going home to meet Jesus. And if we can seize upon that level of philosophy in our mind that this is the bad place and that is the good place, there is a country song that literally states everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to go now. And there is some truth to that because we don't want to go right now. We think this is our home. That is the land where we will eventually end up. But if we can have a role reversal in our mind and see this place as just a place that we're hanging out with for just a little bit of time and that place is our actual home, well, what do we have to lose? Why should we worry about any of these things around us? If somebody if somebody punches us in the mouth, we can say, I hope the Lord Jesus blesses you and count that as just an extra crown that we're going to be able to toss at the feet of Jesus when we finally get there. There's just nothing else to say about it. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth into a large place. He delivered me because He delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He hath recompensed me. Now verse 20, talking about rewards, we're talking about what is your measure? And just like when I said, whenever you have a door slammed in your face, what was your reaction in that moment? It's a measure of your person. And David's reward, David's deliverance from God, was directly in, in parallel to the righteousness that he had displayed. Like I said, David didn't just spend his time running. David did a lot of things. In fact, David showed Saul a lot of kindness he didn't have to, t- have to show him. He walked up right where Saul slept, took something right off of him, walked away and said, Saul, I was right there by you and you can clearly see I'm not trying to murder you. I'm not trying to take your crown. You are the king of Israel, the one that God laid at the throne and I will respect that. You need to respect me as your successor. According to the righteousness, he was rewarded. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Can we say the same thing? For all his judgments were before me, and and I did not put uh, away his statues from me. I was upright before him. I have kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands in his eyesight, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with an upright man, thou wilt shew thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt shew thyself pure, and with the froward, thou wilt shew thyself froward. Now, what is he saying here? He's, David is in no uncertain terms, and this is the last verse of our reading for today, uh, is in no, uh, no uncertain terms laying out the contract that is between God and man. For a saved person... If you do right, God will do right by you. And if you do wrong, God will do wrong by you. Does that mean you can work your way to salvation? Does that mean that you can do all the right things and somehow arrive? No, but that contract exists. And it's, it's almost Newtonian. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. God says, if you do this, I will do this. And if you do wrong, I'm going to do wrong by you. You know, we talk about vessels a lot. Vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. Very simple election-based typology there. But you know something? I have a bucket that I've been feeding our dog with for a very long time, and I had to get a new one. You know know why? The one that had been serving me for about two years gave up on me. It broke. And so I had to go get a new, new vessel. So am I saying you can lose your salvation? No, but you can become very unuseful to God. Brother Ken, if you were not pursuing your ministry, God would find a new bucket yeah. and will find a new bucket. There's been many times that I've been offered other paths, but I find myself right now in the things that I'm doing, as close to the work that God wants me to be in as I can possibly be. And if I stray, even but a second, 
a new person will take my place because God's will and God's work will be outlined. Why are all these other countries having revival and, and, and good things? Because those people are pursuing the work that God is calling them to do and God is rewarding them at their hand. And why do we see nothing? Because we're not doing anything that we're supposed to do and God is rewarding us at, at His hand. Simple enough. Yeah. David outlines this, this, this fact. Why did God come and help David? Well, because David called and David remained faithful. Two big things there. Any questions or comments about the first 26 verses of Psalm 18? I know I read more than I taught, but there's a lot there. If not, we start at 5 in... Paris, Tennessee, if you don't have the address, go to Christian Fellowship PBC, and it's on there. <laughs> 204, North 204 North Poplar Street. Be there, be square, or at least send your prayer. <laughs> have a great week. Thank you all.